Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Harvard Culture Lab Open House. My name is Hana Omiya, and I am the project manager for the Harvard Office for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And I'm joined by many of my teammates today on this call. I'm going to turn it over. Let's hear from Harvard's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Dr. Sherry Charleston. Thank you, Hannah. Um, good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to be with you all today in community. Um, it's always a great day when I get to uh, meet with members of this, you know, the community more broadly, but um, this group of innovators in particular um, is always so exciting um, to connect with because it's an opportunity for me to get energized with all of the energy that you all bring um, into the space. Um, I, you know, I want to thank Hannah for her leadership and administration over this program and her music selection. Um, I actually could not have picked a better song to describe how I feel. I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, right? Like this, the group of people, um, you know, that is assembled here today gives me so much energy and hope for our campus and the future. So, um, so really, um, I don't want to be cheesy, but I, I really just know that in my heart, I am saying you're the apple of my eye, but I won't say that out loud because that would be a little corny. Um, but again, um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, we are so grateful to you that you've taken the time to bring your curiosity, your ideas, your commitment um, to our community, um, to the Culture Lab. Um, achieving inclusive excellence here, which is our sort of North Star at Harvard, is really going to require all of us. Um, and when we think about how we foster an environment where everyone can thrive, it means that we have to take innovative approaches to thinking about how we create that space. So I am beyond grateful to you for your partnership. Um, we are so excited to share with you the Culture Lab Innovation Fund opportunity um, and talk a little bit more about it. Um, you know, we've designed this program to empower the community, uh, to give us your ideas and to think, help us to think about new approaches to everything from inclusivity to accessibility, to social, social justice, health, so many other things. Um, you know, for from 2022, we had 13 grants that were awarded. Um, many of them are here, to, many of those grant award winners are here today. They represent all the schools and units from across this great university. And each year, um, because we contribute, we because we distribute $200,000, um, it gives us more opportunities to engage more units in this work. Um, so again, thank you for taking this opportunity for joining us. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of your proposals. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Hannah. Sherry, thank you so much for that energizing introduction. Um, as you can see, this team is so fun to work with and all of us are pretty supportive. So don't be shy about your questions. No question is too silly. Um, and we welcome your energy and ideas today. So we're going to move on to um, sharing our screen and giving an introduction to what the Culture Lab is all about. Let me go ahead and do that now. Um, one of the biggest offerings from the Harvard Culture Lab is our Innovation Fund. This grant opportunity distributes $5,000 to $15,000 over the course of one year. And it's given to those who have an idea to foster a project that in, uh, enhances the sense of belonging on Harvard's campus. The first year award winners are also eligible for a second year grant, and this is up to $25,000. Um, we think it's important that we provide scaling grant opportunities so that if you have a working pilot, you can expand that idea to larger community members your second year. So what are we looking for in someone's idea? Each idea that is submitted should try to answer one of these strategic questions that drive our office's mission. They are, how do we recruit, retain, and develop a diverse community? How do we create an inclusive and equitable campus climate? And how might we foster a community where everyone has a full sense of belonging. I want to share these strategic questions with you, which were designed in partnership with Dr. Sherry Ann Charleston, 
Um, because as Harvard leaders, we are often charged with solving issues in the world. But this grant gives us the opportunity to look inside our campus and apply a solution locally and test our idea at Harvard. The last section that I'll say before turning it over to ARAM is eligibility. This is the biggest question that I hear from most applicants is who can apply? So first, please apply as a team. That means in your application, you should have at minimum two team names or two applicant names um, because we like to encourage collaboration in these innovations. Second, make sure that the primary applicant, the person who's submitting the application is either a Harvard University benefits eligible faculty, staff, postdoc, researcher, and academic personnel, or that you are a Harvard University full-time degree-seeking undergrad or graduate student. Um, I will say, you know, Hana, maybe I am a half-time person, or I graduated Harvard three years ago and I'm still interested in campus opportunities. How can I be included? So these criteria listed are required, particularly for the primary applicant. This person is responsible for managing financial administration and making sure the proposal is aligned with the university. But your teammates have the capacity for all types of designations at Harvard, and we welcome Harvard diverse affiliates and alumni. If you have a complicated affiliation with the university, we recognize it's different for everyone. Feel free to email us or ask us at any time, even in the breakout rooms, and we can walk you through what's possible. Any questions so far about the strategic questions or the eligibility for this grant? Feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself. So there's plenty of opportunity to keep asking questions, but at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Hannah, for your insightful presentation. Um, my name is Aram. I'm a project management fellow at the Harvard Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. My pronouns are the she series, and I'm from Ghana. I'm black. I have a weave on. Um, I wear glasses, and I'm wearing a cream top. Um, Today we're going to highlight a few of our of um, Cliff recipients' projects from last year. Last year we awarded thirteen grants to thirteen amazing projects, but today we are just going to highlight three of those amazing projects. Um, you're welcome to go to the Cliff website to to have an idea of all the three of the thirteen projects that received funding last last year. After their presentations, we'll have a five minutes Q&A to address any questions or concerns that you may have about the presentation. So today we're going to hear from the First Generation Visibility Week, the Neurodiversity Project and Decolonized Healing. And we're going to start with the First Generation Visibility Week. So I'll hand over to Marvin and Sadi to give us more detail about the amazing project. Thank you so, so much. Um, as Marvin cues it up, good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. We just thank you all for the opportunities, um, Odib and Cliff. Uh, thank you for being amazing partners and supporting us in this work. And we're just excited to present what we've been up to um, with our First Generation Visibility Week. Uh, I'll start with introductions. My name is Shade Abraham. I take the She Series. I'm a Black woman, shorter in stature, um, wearing a marble colored dress, and I have brown hair and glasses on my head. Um, Marvin? Hi, everyone. I'm um, echoing what Shade said. Really excited to be here and really grateful to Odiv and the Cliff Grant um, for um, being here. Um, my name is Marvin Backleg. I'm the senior director, I mean, the assistant director for student programming at the Harvard Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations. Um, I am Filipino American. My pronouns are he and his. I have short black hair, brown skin, um, and I'm wearing a dark navy jacket. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you reminded me to, um, to name my title. I'm also <laughs> Shadi Abraham, the senior director of the Harvard Foundation. And you'll notice in our presentation, a highlight of sunflowers. Um, that was intentional. This is actually a part of the theme of first generation visibility. We came directly from alumni quotes about navigating their journey um, as a first gen low income student on campus and always looking towards the sun as sunflowers do. So that's why we use this as a theme for our presentation today. So we just want to quickly add some context. We have a short amount of time, but we are definitely going to link to our uh, website and also our newsletter for more information. But we just want to situate our work in the context of the Harvard Foundation. Uh, many of our team members are in the room today, and um, this project is directly in alignment with our goals and our strategic plans as well. Um, and again, this is just a little bit more of the details about the foundation and the work that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you, Shade. Um, so we wanted to quickly go over our goals for First Generation Visibility Week. Um, so First Gen Visibility Week was a series of events and visibility campaigns that took place on November 3rd through the 9th of 2022. And we had three main goals, which were to increase the awareness around the systemic barriers that impact first generation college students. Um, the second goal being to validate and celebrate the identities of first generation college students in order for them to thrive at Harvard. And lastly, to uh, be able to equip first generation college students with the community cultural wealth or resources and supports to be able to thrive at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is truly uh, in alignment with the One Harvard mission. Uh, we had several community partners and collaborators um, I listed here, 17 offices, we won't name them all, um, and seven student groups. Um, and we were just so thankful for having that community and that warmth of a partnership with us as we uh, did this project. Yes, um, so this is our sort of event schedule. I won't go over all of our events that happened throughout First Generation Visibility Week, um, but in total, there were about 20 events that took place, ranging from professional development um, workshops from our Harvard offices like OCS, um, URAF, and um, the Credit Union, in addition to peer-led dialogues that were facilitated by our Harvard Foundation interns, um, social events that took place in addition to our annual um, event event that takes place, which is on um, National First Generation Day of Celebration, our annual Sunflower and Red Book giveaway, uh, which took place on November 8th. And in addition to sort of um, those statistics that we provided about how many events we had and how many offices and student groups we engaged, uh, we also had eight uh, student highlights on the lamppost banners in Harvard Yard. Um, so while students and, and staff were walking to either their class or their offices, they were able to look up and, and see um, those highlights. Uh, we also had significant increases in terms of our uh, newsletter subscribers, Instagram followers, um, attendees at First Generation Visibility Week were very high at about 500 students. Um, and we also, uh, thanks to the Harvard College um, Instagram, was, were able to um, get significant increases in our content for First Generation Visibility Week as well. And these are just some photos that contextualize that. As you can see, it was fun had by all. We have um, pres uh, President-elect Gay, uh, Dean Fitzsimmons, uh, Dean Altamaro. There were several students um, coming to all of our events. We even ran out of things in the first 10 minutes of the event. So definitely show the demand for this type of work um, and the in, in the engagement of the students and wanting more of these initiatives. Uh, in terms of the data, we conducted pre and post surveys, and you could say we were very pleased with this data. 97.9% satisfaction rate with 60.9% of the folks that attended um, it, uh, indicated that they were very satisfied with the offerings. Um, it also had we also had a 17.7 increase uh, percent increase in students strongly agreeing with being aware of issues that impact first gen students. So this is great for those who are um, identifying, but these are this is also great for students who are just getting to learn about other identities on campus and wanting to support um, and just learn more. So I think that's also a great indicator as well. And going over sort of our last two data pieces, uh, we also wanted to highlight uh, significant increases in students strongly agreeing with feeling that their uh, identity as a first generation college student is celebrated at Harvard, uh, both with strongly agreeing and overall increases in agreement um, with that specific data piece as well. Um, and uh, lastly, there is there, we also identified a significant increase in students strongly agreeing with feeling connected to resources and supports in order to thrive at Harvard as well. 
Um, and uh, lastly, we also wanted to highlight some student uh, testimonials to provide some qualitative data as well. So I think I'll just um, go ahead and read the uh, uh, first one. It was a wonderful week. People were constantly talking about it in my classes and in my programs. It was awesome to hear everyone supporting and celebrating FGLI students. The other testimonials also talked about um, being seen, truly seen. Um, and um, oftentimes it being lonely, but um, this allowed them to not feel as lonely as a first generation college students um, at Harvard. Um, so with that being said, uh, we want to thank you all again for listening to our presentation on our Cliff Grant project. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin and Sade, for the amazing work you're doing for first generation students here at Harvard. We'll now move on to Taylor to give us more detail about what she and her team are doing with Decolonized Healing at Harvard. Thank you. My name is Taylor McGuire. Um, I am, I use the She series. I am African American or Black. My hair is curly. I have glasses and braces, and I'm wearing a teal sweater. And I'll pass it over to Frankie to introduce herself, too. Hi, I'm Frankie. Uh, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm wearing glasses. I have curly hair, and I'm wearing Black. So I can start presenting on our project Decolonized Healing. Um, that's our formal project name. And what our project consists of is a minority stress and empowerment workshop that we deliver to graduate students across Harvard. And so just to reiterate, Frankie and I are doctoral students in clinical psychology at Harvard, and we are the primary workshop coordinators and the co-leads for decolonized healing. So we've developed this workshop. And along with us are some doctoral students who are also workshop coordinators who identify with minoritized identities and also supervisors and collaborators across Harvard in the psychology department and across ODIV. So our workshop is mainly for graduate students who've experienced stressful life events or really engaged in behaviors that they wish they hadn't when they're feeling strong emotions. So feeling isolated or isolating when feeling down, sacrificing sleep when stressed, procrastinating when they're feeling anxious. So really all of us, all of us have experienced something like this at some point in time. So we really market it as being applicable in all types of experiences for all types of students. But uniquely for our workshop is that we frame it using a minority stress and we focus on the fact that minority students at Harvard encounter everyday discrimination and that being on Harvard's campus and specifically being people of color and people with marginalized identities can lead us to feel more anxious and have higher rates of depression and be in more hostile settings. And so even in our um, in our DSAS mental health survey for graduate students, my, um, students with minoritized identities reported having these feelings of anxiety and depression and also reported a lack of belonging um, in the program. And so we just really wanna frame our workshop as discrimination can be traumatic and unsafe. And we're framing our workshop in that way so that we can also provide ways for students dealing with minority stress to cope with and also develop coping strategies that are um, useful to them. And so the workshop is a two hour session where we split it up into four different topics. So we start with emotions and emotional awareness. So we teach um, participants that, you know, there are three components to emotions, which consist of the physiological response, behaviors, and also thoughts that we have, and just how to identify those with relevant examples rooted in minority stress. We then pivot to present focused awareness. So we discuss um, mindfulness and we have a few different guided meditation sessions as well. And then we, we switch to cognitive flexibility. So just this idea of opening up your interpretation. So while we think we usually have, or while we experience situations, we usually have automatic thoughts. And this section is really to take some time to come up with alternative interpretations and also discuss when it might be unsafe for us to do so. And then we close on value-driven action. So when we're feeling stressed, sometimes we avoid. And in this section of the workshop, we focus on the idea that 
sometimes it might be helpful to do the opposite in the moment or even to do things that align with our values and our goals. So in terms of the update that we have um, for the fall, we spent the majority of the time developing and also um, soliciting feedback from ODIB, hiring administrative coordinators, drafting our qualitative and quantitative questions, which we can talk more to in the breakout room, getting IRB approval, confirming workshop leaders and getting feedback from them, and also developing our spring rollout plan. And this semester, we finalized the workshop slides, developed pre and post measures, um, and also contacted affinity groups like Du Bois, MBSH, HGYs, and LSA to try and um, administer the workshop within their groups over March and April. And so we're planning to hold at least four workshops this semester, collect pre and post data, and also reach out to additional affinity groups for scheduling for the fall and spring of next year so we can keep this project going. So thank you for your time, and we'll be happy to talk more in the breakout room. Thank you for your insightful presentation, Taylor. Um, we'll move on to Isabel to tell us about how they are creating our awareness about neurodiversity at Harvard. Okay, so thank you, Iram, and thank you to the Harvard Cultural Lab for the invitation to showcase our project today. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel Kerstein. I am Portuguese, born in the Azores Islands. I have bronze straight hair, but currently with a rose gold touch. I have pale skin uh, and I'm wearing glasses today. And my pronouns are she, her. I am a research fellow at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center or BIDMC and Harvard Medical School. I'm a neurobiologist using computational models and bioinformatics to understand Alzheimer's disease, but I'm really fascinated by all things brain really. Um, I am also one of the organizers at the My Project, which is a space for collaboration, advocacy, and community building in mental health. And today I'm here as one of the project leads of the Neurodiversity Project, a program about the celebration of the variations of the human mind. And you can learn more about it at the mindproject.us slash neurodiversity and by following the hashtag Andy Harvard on Twitter and on LinkedIn. You can also find the mind uh, find the mind project on Twitter at TMP underscore HMS, and I've included in the slide my email uh, in case you want to follow up after today's meeting. So there are a number of different ways that we at the mind project are implementing your diversity at Harvard, and today I brought a few examples of some of the most exciting things that we have been doing. In the fall, we treated the campus to neurodiversity cookies uh, and resources for Harvard staff, students, and scholars at the Harvard Disability as Diversity Celebration, organized by Harvard Disability Resources. We have been collaborating with Think Research Podcast from Harvard Catalyst. Uh, and last year, we launched a mini series on mental health in science and medicine, uh, focused on um, uh, trainings, so students uh, and uh, postgraduates. And uh, these series actually made their 2022 highlights, which was very uh, encouraging for us. And we are currently working on more episodes for 2023 uh, around the topic of mental health, including episodes specifically about neurodiversity. We have added information about neurodiversity uh, to our website, including blog posts. And we're actually open to collaborations for blog posts on the topic of neurodiversity and mental health more broadly. So if you would like to write a blog post with us, let us know. Our project was recently featured at the 2023 uh, Harvard's annual Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging Forum. Uh, and you can watch the full video that played at, at the forum on YouTube, uh, and the link is in our website. Uh, we are collaborating with the Harvard Medical School Black Staff Caucus in organizing the event Black Mental Health Experiences Storytelling to Music. And this will be an evening featuring creative works by indiv individuals sharing their challenges, triumphs, and experiences around mental health. And in this hybrid event, uh, these people will uh, 
tell their stories. Uh, and this will be Harvard uh, University's Black students, faculty, staff. And the cool part, or even cooler part, uh, in my opinion anyway, is that they will be accompanied by members of the orchestra, Me Too, uh, which is a classical musical organization cre created for individuals with mental illness and the people who support them. So I absolutely invite you to attend on May 3rd uh, at 6 p.m. We are also working with Harvard Disability Resources on training and information videos specifically on the topic of neurodiversity. Um, and we are conducting a survey to evaluate the neurodiversity knowledge and interests of our community and to better understand the needs of those who identify as neurodivergent at Harvard University. Finally, well, we have created the Neurodiversity Affinity Group, and this is a space to promote connection, belonging, and community building, which encourages open dialogue without judgments, and this will be through, through monthly meetings and events. Anyone interested in neurodiversity and in supporting a neurodiversity community can join the group, and you can learn more um, visiting our website at themindproject.us slash neurodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, Sade, Marvin, and Taylor for your presentations. All your projects are outstanding role models for changing the culture of belonging at Harvard. Um, we'd have quite, we have time for a few questions. And so if you have any questions for our project leaders, kindly type it in the chat and um, we would, would respond to them. Thanks so much, Aram, and what a stunning array of presentations by our Cultural Out grant recipients. Um, we do have a question that was submitted anonymously. Feel free to keep sending us some through the Q&A or the chat feature if you'd like. Uh, I have a question here that says for folks, a lot of these projects seem very ambitious. Um, how were you able to balance your project commitments and your normal commitment at Harvard? Um, Sade, would you like to answer this? Oh, sure. Um, I actually think we're we're quite lucky because it, throughout the Harvard Foundation, it deeply aligns with our work. Um, and we are, under our offices of our office, we support first generation low income students, so it tied in really nicely. So, I, one of the things I would suggest maybe is as you're thinking about your projects, are there ways that there are areas of synergy, perhaps, um, with the other areas of work that you have at Harvard? If not, I think communication is also key in and bandwidth <laughs> in in that because it can become so exciting and all encompassing, but just trying to manage what you can do in one year and be open to iterating and building on um, thereafter. I don't know if other, thing, other folks have things to add to that. I, I can go ahead and answer <laughs> because that's definitely a big challenge that we, we have. So everyone at the My Project, we are um, researchers. I say I, I often introduce myself saying that on my spare time I were I, I do things at the Mind Project and the Neurodiversity Project was definitely something we wanted to make at the Mind Project, but it's Neurodiversity and the Mind Project that is the challenge finding time to do that. So one way, one sort of um, not necessarily a big solution, but something that definitely helped us was when we submitted our um, application, a big part of the funding was to recruit a part-time student to help us. Um, so that's definitely something we, we've recruited Anuksha, which is a fabulous, super excited uh, student, and she's been helping us move forward. So that was, was something. Uh, but then apart from that, it is a challenge. It's really hard. It's evenings and weekends that we so yeah definitely something to keep in mind being ambitious but being mindful of your time absolutely thank Fantastic. you for thanks aram um i do have the time for one or two more questions and the ones that we don't get to uh we will be moving into breakout rooms shortly so feel free to save them and bring them um, from Liz, she asks, does the project have to impact the entire university or could it be related to a particular school or a smaller community? Um, Taylor, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, so I 
I believe it could impact really any type of group on campus. I think that while our project for decolonized healing is impactful for minoritized, um, for people with minoritized identities, um, we're addressing it by going within GSAS to talk with graduate students and with graduate students across affinity groups. So I think like we're not able, able to touch every graduate student, but we are trying to like focus on those with minorities identities. That's exactly right. And then uh, last question here. Um, I'm going to try to sneak in two questions in one. Um, how were you able to fund the entire project in $15,000? Or did you need to draw from additional funding? And then can you define the timeline of your projects? Um, Marvin, would you like to have Yes. Um, so like what Shade mentioned, we did have a budget for um, first generation um, initiatives already. So we, we tapped a little bit into that, but we definitely used the entire 15,000 for our programming. Um, and then to answer the second question about, um, sorry, what was the second part? Marvin, can you tell us the timeline? for your project? Yes. Um, so over the summer and um, into the first part of the uh, the fall semester, we did um, our planning and ideation for First Generation Visibility Week. Um, and then our program took place November 3rd through the 9th. Um, and then after the 9th, we started to do uh, post program surveys as well um, to uh, be able to conduct that and, and, and parse out data. Once again, thank you to our amazing project leaders for their amazing project. Um, we we'll now have um, a presentation. I'll take you through the um, process for applying for the um, Culture Lab Innovation Grant. Um, so as you can see on the screen, there are two rounds, the first round and the second round. The first round it's an, an online application. And so you just need to go to the Cliff website. You see a link that says apply today and it will take you directly to the application form. We have um, about 13 questions. Um, we have 13 questions and we just require you to give us um, details about your project and give us an idea of how much you need and how you're going to um, make um, how you're going to budget with the money. The second round is a video pitch contest. So after the deadline, Quite a number, um, a number of judges would um, look at your applications and choose a number of finalists who will qualify for the second round, which is a video pitch contest, which will be held in May. So before before um, the contest will be given, the finalists will be given ample time to prepare a video pitch um, for the second round. And this round is going to be judged by the senior officers of the Harvard Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, we want you to take note of these dates. Um, so on March 3rd, 7th, 10th, 16th, 21st, and 23rd, we are going to hold office hours. Um, so as you prepare your application, you may have an issue, you may have a concern, you may have a challenge. Please feel free to register for office hours on the Cliff website and we'll be available to respond to all your questions and concerns. Um, we also want to remind you that um, the deadline for application is on 24th March. So please do well to finish and submit your applications by the deadline. And as I said earlier, the video pitch would be held in May and the winners would be announced in June. I would hand over to Hannah to take us through the review criteria. Thanks, Aram. So uh, these are the kind of seven criteria that all of our judges are trained to look for in each proposal. First is alignment to one of the three strategic questions. Second is inclusive design, making sure you are taking advantage of the university disability resources and accessible education for your project. Third is innovation. Are you pitching a new idea or a different idea that we haven't seen yet at Harvard? Fourth is the impact. Does your application include a way to measure how successful or what success means for your project. One Harvard, this is um, an invitation for you to think about creating a team with diverse roles across Harvard. 
and multidisciplinary projects are welcome. You can also create teams that are cross schools and units and include Harvard alumni and affiliates in addition to students, faculty, staff, and postdocs. Promising practice. So does your idea, um, can it be a role model for others in the future? And then last but not least is the connection to campus. As a reminder, your idea should have a direct influence on a Harvard community or campus. Any questions here about the review criteria or the process of applying the grant? Yes, I'm going to take this time to answer a couple questions from the chat. Um, Deanna asked, if accepted, when would funds be released? Would we be able to conduct it for plans in the summer? So once you apply and the video pitch finishes in May, finalists are announced by the end of June. We have had in the past programs that ran in mid-July and asked for a grant transfer early, but the standard project will start receiving funds and can use it in early August. I have a question from Ozki. What should be the time frame of the projects for funding? So you typically want to pitch a proposal that can finish in a year. And your goal can also be, we want to keep this going year after year, but our pilot will be conducted in the time frame of an academic year. And a question from uh, Nalita, can a Harvard alumni be involved? Yes. New questions from Teresa. Can a Harv, uh, let's see, is the video pitch live or recorded from Philip? Thank you. Yes, the video pitch will actually be pre recorded by the projects and then shared online to the judges. So, not live, and you have time to practice. Um, and there are great examples of former video pitches on the Cliff website, including those of us who presented today. And then finally, um, we have an anonymous question. How many applicants do we usually receive? This actually varies year to year. Um, typically, we see really good ideas between the 30 to 60 um, number mark. And then last year, we awarded 13 projects. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. These are the ways to keep in touch after this event, and I hope you take the time to get to know everybody else who joined us today, too. Reminder to apply by March 24th. The application is available on our Cliff website. We do offer office hours twice a week through the month of March, so sign up for those at our website. If you don't have a unique idea, but you still want to be engaged, you can sign up to be a judge. Join our March orientation, and I'm happy to train you um, to receive and read the amazing projects coming your way. And last but not least, reach out anytime to myself and my team at the DIB underscore culture lab.harvard.edu email address.